five. So we'll be letting in more participants throughout the seminar, but for now, we're just gonna get started with our introduction. We are Advocate for Lives, a youth-led organization that raises awareness for blood and organ donation, as well as health-related research. Uh, before we start, we just wanna go over a few housekeeping rules. Please don't spam any texts in the chat, as well as having no swearing or inappropriate language. And anything that you put in the chat, let's make sure it's relevant to the seminar. As well, please have your mics off unless otherwise asked to have them on by the speaker. And you guys probably just got the notification, but we'll be recording the session so that we can post it on our YouTube channel for anyone to uh, go over the session in the future. Now that we've got all of those rules out of the way, we're going to be talking to Dr. Sierra Richard today, a women's health and pediatric clinical pharmacist. She is the founder of Happy Farm Life and she makes empowering as well as educational content on her social media. So we will be addressing all of your questions from both the Google form and the chat at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, Dr. Ciara, please take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And like she said, my name is Dr. Ciara Richard. I currently am a practicing pediatric and women's health clinical pharmacist at a women's and children's hospital in Missouri, which is right smack dab in the middle of the United States. And like she said, I am the founder of Happy Farm Life, which is mostly a social media platform that I use to educate um, women to make sure they have the knowledge and power to take control of their own health care and have a happy, healthy life while taking medication. So just some objectives for today. I'm going to be explaining the process of becoming a clinical pharmacist. This is the process process that I went through, but I want to make sure that you realize, depending on what country you're in, as well as what area of interest you are in, this can look a little bit different for each pharmacist. And I know plenty of pharmacists who took a very different path than me and still ended up in a clinical pharmacist position. So I'm going to talk about some of those variables, as well as what a day in the life of a clinical pharmacist looks like for me. Again, this is going to vary between hospitals and specialty areas, but hopefully this gives you a good like overview idea of what some of the tasks look like. I'll also be summarizing the role of a clinical pharmacist in research and what clinical pharmacists do to add to literature, um, specifically relating to medications and the pharmacist's role in the healthcare team. I'm also going to be discussing how pharmacists assist with organ donation. This is something that um, was really exciting to me when I was a student and learning how this process worked. And I have had the opportunity to be a part of both um, organ donors as well as recipients. So it's been a really cool opportunity to see that. And I'm going to be sharing some of those processes with you, as well as describing the role of a pharmacist within the healthcare team and what that kind of looks like now and where it might look in the future. So first, I kind of want to give you an overview of what I did in high school. So I took a lot of science and math courses. Um, when I was in high school, I knew I really liked science and math. At first, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I, I just took chemistry, biology, calculus, geometry, trigonometry, those types of classes that I knew would probably be required in college in order to become a pharmacist. I also made sure I partic participated in extracurricular activities. So I was involved in sports. I played basketball and volleyball in school. I was a member of the band. I played saxophone. And then I had some leadership roles, including being the president of the science club, as well as being involved in some honor societies and other things throughout high school to kind of give, give me some things on my resume for college. The biggest thing that really shifted me towards the pharmacy career was working in a community pharmacy. In my state that I was in during high school, I was in Missouri. And so in the state of Missouri, there was no age restrictions on becoming a pharmacy technician. So I worked as a technician starting at the age of 16. It just was supposed to be a summer job and it turned into a job that I kept every summer and would help fill in during other breaks such as Christmas. Um, and I fell in love with the patients. I really enjoyed everything that went into pharmacy. Not only was it patient interaction and you were getting to know your patients, but also there were opportunities for me to teach, which was something I really wanted to do. I had originally said when I was younger that I wanted to be a teacher, and there is so much teaching involved with pharmacy, which I will talk about later. 
Another thing that I did that you definitely don't have to do, but I participated in my own research study during high school and actually was able to participate in the International Science Fair as a representative of the United States for my research. So there is opportunities in high school to get involved with research and that definitely helped um, my college resume. I actually had already accepted um, a college offer before I participated, but my college knew about it, sent me a card um, and was in their um, newsletter for the school. So it was really a cool opportunity, even though I did it my last year of high school, but it can be a booster for your resume as well previous years. So as far as what you need to do in college, um, this is probably gonna vary again between schools, but this is kind of some of the general recommendations that you will see for schools as far as what you need to take in college courses in order to get into pharmacy school. So having general biology and general chemistry and general physics are pretty much givens. Um, you're gonna need to have that groundwork of those science courses in order to be successful in pharmacy school. Other things that you're going to go into are a little bit more in depth. So microbiology, cell biology, anatomy and physiology. Um, we had to do one with a lab where we had cadavers and did dissections. That was a requirement to get into pharmacy school. So we still do that in depth work. Um, calculus was required as well as organic chemistry. Um, if you've talked to anybody who's taken organic chemistry, it is a very difficult course. It's also required for anybody who is pre Med. So if you're trying to look to get out of chemistry courses, pharmacy is not the option for you because we do a lot of chemistry. Um, in addition, English composition, we do a lot of writing as pharmacists, whether it's communicating with the team or it is pharmacists or medical writers. So there's opportunities there as well. So communication and speech is also important. Like I said, we're dealing with a lot of teaching. So we're teaching students and residents and nurses and other providers. So those communication skills are key. Statistics is also something that is typically required or recommended. Um, you will do some statistics in school, but we spend a lot of time looking at primary literature and evaluating it to determine how good that literature is. So statistics is helpful in that manner. Biochemistry is a huge part of pharmacy. Some schools like mine had that built into the pharmacy school program. Some of them required it prior to. And then there'll be other requirements depending on the school specifically. So you'll see some variations in this, but basically what you should know is you're gonna have some basics that you'll need to take that are not science and math related, but most of your prerequisites for pharmacy school are gonna be very heavy in science and math. I use science and math every day. So that's kind of what to expect. In college, I also participated in a lot of extracurricular activities. So like I said, I still did that summer job in a pharmacy. Some pharmacy students or pre-pharmacy students will work as a technician full time. I chose not to do that because I wanted to go to pharmacy school after two years of undergrad. So I took a heavy class load that really didn't leave a ton of time for work. I was also involved in organizations. So I did some leadership, um, particularly with our international students. And then also pharmacy schools and colleges, and I know med schools are the same way. They also like to know that you don't just do work, work, work all the time, but you have some fun as well. So here's a picture of me doing some intramural soccer because I wanted to have some extracurricular activities that were fun as well. Um, a lot of students are involved in research, again, because I did that two-year condensed path, I didn't really get too involved in research in undergrad, but I did volunteer a lot for just different activities on campus as well as off campus. So for pharmacy school application, again, this is for the United States, so it will vary a little bit if you are in Canada, but here in the United States, a lot of the schools require the PCAT, which is the pharmacy college admission test. And then um, you will complete an application through FarmCAS, which includes an essay or personal statement, your transcripts from college, letters of recommendation. The number will vary and who should be your letters of recommendation will vary. For example, some schools will require 
a employer or some of them don't care and you have to have three, some places you have to have five. So that'll vary a little bit between schools. They'll want to see your GPA, any test scores you have like the PCAT, some of them may have other test scores that they wanna see, like how did you do on your ACT or SAT? And then they'll also have a place for you to list any extracurricular activities. And then after you do all of those things, if they really like your application, they will wanna meet you. Previously in person, a lot of places are doing virtual interviews now, but you'll do some sort of interview where you interact with a variety of people. A little tip that I'm gonna give you about applications, this is across the board, no matter what you're wanting to apply for, be super nice to everybody involved. So when I was a pharmacy school applica applicant, I didn't know who all was going to be evaluating me. So I just assumed everybody in the school was evaluating me. It was a probably a great assumption because I have been on the other side now as a student ambassador and we actually submitted our recommendations and thoughts on the students. At the end of the day, I was giving tours and I was like the person who was taking people between their different interview spots, but all of that was taken into note when they were deciding who to admit. So every single one of your um, interview people, everybody who you're involved with, just assume that they have a say in how you interact because for example, when you're in a room with somebody who's interviewing you, you know, you know you're being interviewed, you know you're on the spot. So pharmacy schools and medical schools alike want to know how you're gonna interact with other students, which is gonna be the base of who the other people you're um, working with and those sorts of things. So if you're talking to students, even virtually, just assume they have some sort of say in the application process. So the pharmacy school structure where um, I went was a traditional structure, but there's also block styled and accelerated styles. And all of these structures will award graduates with a doctor of pharmacy degree. So I'm gonna go through each um, different type. And what I wanna just say out front is there's no right or wrong way, or even I don't think a best way to go about this. Every single form has their pros and cons. And I think it just comes down to what is best for you. You know how you are as a learner. For me, I really like the traditional style, um, mainly because I like to get some repetition and see some of those disease states more than once. Um, so I can keep fresh and kind of build on my knowledge, whereas some people like to do everything at once. So maybe a block style is best for them. So those are all things to consider when deciding where you would like to apply. So a traditional pharmacy school structure, in the first two years, it's pretty much all didactic or classroom learning. You're going to be in the classroom, going over disease states. It's very similar to undergrad is where you have certain classes that you take, you rotate through those. It's a little bit more of a set structure. In pharmacy school, there'll be certain classes you have to take each semester with the opportunity to choose your electives. Um, my school required a certain number of electives on top of the required classes, and then you could take more than that if you wanted to, or, or just take the right amount, whatever fit for your style. And then year three, um, you start doing some more didactic and experiential learning. Experiential learning is where you're actually taking care of patients. It's applying the stuff in the classroom. You're usually in a pharmacy or in the hospital um, or different settings, which I'll talk about later in that fourth year. But this is where you start not spending all of your time in the classroom and you start spending more time with your patients applying the things that you're still learning in the classroom. And then the last year is completely experiential learning. So you are in different pharmacy settings throughout the year and you're learning from patients and preceptors who are active pharmacists. I'm a preceptor myself, and we are teaching students what we do every day and how to do our jobs with the hope at the end of every single clinical rotation that the pharmacy student that we are teaching will be able to do our job. Now, are they gonna do it perfectly or no? Are they going to be at the same level of knowledge about whatever particular area it is? Absolutely not, but will they be able to find the resources that they need to do the job. That's kind of the end goal with those. So with a block style, 
years one and three, you're covering information about specific disease states and organ systems all at once. So you may do like a cardiology block, and then you're going to talk about all the meds, all the different disease states that you need to talk about cardiology rise in that block. And then you're going to move on. You're not going to see that again until you're on rotations. Um, there's benefits to this as well because you're getting all that information at once. So some people say it's a little bit more streamlined. Other people don't like it because they don't see that disease state again. So it kind of just varies depending on, again, preference. Um, years one and two, you probably won't be doing much um, experiential learning, even in the block style. You may do some, but really, again, in that third year, you'll probably see more of it. And then that last year will still be experiential learning. And then an accelerated program is where you condense all the PharmD curriculum into three years. This usually is a year round program. So it requires going in the summer. Um, you'll have minimal breaks. Um, I had a friend who did one in Arizona and she had like one to two week breaks, like two weeks at Christmas, one week in between each like section. And they basically had like three semesters that didn't fit in the same traditional semesters that you're going to see at a regular traditional or block style. But like I said, all of those structures will award graduates with a doctor of pharmacy degree. So for that didactic portion or the classroom learning, there are tons and tons of classes you have to take in those four years. A lot of hours go into this. So I just kind of want to give you a little overview of some of the classes you'll probably see no matter where you go. So top 200 or 300 drugs, these classes are pretty similar from the different schools. They all go about it a slightly different way, but it's mostly memorizing the drug facts for the top 300, 200 drugs, depending on the school. So it'll be, you know, what is the medication's brand name, generic? How does it work? What are some basic counseling points, big drug interactions? This this is a very broad over the top overview of these drugs. Medicinal chemistry is kind of a different version of organic chemistry where we're actually doing a lot of reactions and looking at the chemical structure of medications um, and just focusing on medicines specifically. Pathophysiology is really learning um, more of a detailed idea of how the body works at a more microscopic level. We're looking at receptors a little bit more closely, the inside of a cell, how medications may interact with that. Pharmacology is really an overview of how drugs work. We are also going over um, basic side effects and why those occur based on how a drug works. We also do things like farm um, economics. So we look at you know, how the health system works and where pharmacy fits into that. Evidence-based medicine is that class I kind of mentioned earlier where we're looking at statistics and primary literature and research studies and learning how to evaluate whether or not a study is good or not and being able to determine something clinically for a patient based on a article you're looking at. This is a skill that you continue to hone throughout your experiential learning. Every single one of my experiential rotations, I had to practice this with my preceptor and learn more about it. And I continue to do that in residency. You also will do classes on leadership and management because regardless of what practice of pharmacy you go into, you will be a leader of some kind, whether you are being the leader of the medication expert team, a pharmacist um, for a particular unit, or if you are leading technicians or students or other individuals, um, you don't have to be in necessarily a management or leadership role, but you're looking at that as well. Pharmacotherapy is what brings everything together, and that's really applying drug therapy to patient cases. It's where we're looking at disease states and what meds we use for what disease states and we get clinical cases and do those and figure out the best drug therapy for a patient. It's a lot easier on the patients in class than a real patient, but it's a good start and a good introduction to that. Pharmacokinetics is um, a class that a lot of pharmacists um, can find a little bit more challenging because we're really looking at um, how the drug levels look in a body, 
Um, there's a lot of math and calculations involved. So pharmacy calculations is more of the day-to-day -day things that we're gonna do like calculating a dose. Whereas pharmacokinetics is looking at drug levels and how the body is working and where they're storing the drug in the body and it can get pretty complex. Um, but it's a very good skill, especially for somebody like myself who's working in pediatrics and women's health where pregnant women have very different um, fluid amounts and body spacing and fat content than what we see with a regular adult. So we have to do some more of those calculations and interpretation of their kinetics than you may have to do with a regular adult patient who is not pregnant. Same thing with kids, their um, body composition is different than an adult. So we have to do a few more calculations when applying certain drugs to them. Um, we also take an ethics class. I think that's extremely important, how to practice ethically. Um, we also do patient-centered communication. Pharmacists frequently um, talk to patients. Here in the United States, pharmacists are the most accessible healthcare professionals. So we get a lot of questions. I have had questions about pretty much everything. I've had people call and ask if they ate moldy toast for breakfast, are they gonna be okay? I've had questions that are a little bit more geared towards medicine, a lot of questions about over-the-counter supplements or medications. So learning how to talk to patients, how to uh, present information in a way that patients can understand because we get super in-depth in how the drugs work and we know all the nitty gritty details, but what does a patient need to know and how can we communicate that with them in a way that they understand? Sterile and non-sterile compounding are the fun ones. Um, so this is how we actually make medications. So, you know, a lot of medications come pre-filled in tablets and capsules. But again, I work in special populations. So um, a lot of the things that we give kids do not come in a nicely packaged formulation. So we're having to make those or reconstitute those. And so in our non-sterile compounding class, we learn how to make ointments and creams and these things called trochies, which are kind of like gummies. We learned how to make lip balm. We learned how to make um, lollipops. I mean, just anything and everything as well as oral liquid medications, hand sanitizer. I mean, just all kinds of fun stuff. And then in sterile compounding, we learn how to make IV formulations and medications that need to be given through a sterile site. Um, when I was a in pharmacy school, I was a intern. So I actually did a lot of sterile compounding before the class. But if you have not done any of that, this class is very beneficial to learn the basics of that, including all of the garbing and PPE that is involved in just walking into the room. I mean, there's a lot that goes into sterile compounding. And we also talk about, you know, how to do chemotherapy and how to do that safely and protect yourself as well as the product from you. And then we are also taught immunizations. So you get immunization certified. That is technically a class that we get credit for, but we get our certification um, where I was at school from the American Pharmacist Association. So we were doing their course just within the school system. After you complete that, you're able to immunize patients in most states, um, allow students to do that. So I did tons and tons of flu clinics in school once I got that and was able to give a lot of immunizations. I've given hundreds at this point. Um, pharmacy law, this will vary between states, but there's federal law and, and your state law. And um, we had to have two classes. We had a federal law class and a state law class in pharmacy school for my home state. And um, pharmacists in the United States are required to take two exams to become licensed. So you have to take a clinical exam um, called the NAPLEX. And then you also have to take the state law exam, which is every law that's specific to that state. You have to know the differences if you're doing multiple states. I'm licensed in two states. So I had to take law in Missouri and Texas where I did my residency. And I did those within a few weeks of each other. And let me tell you, it gets complicated when the laws are different. So um, this class is good if you're gonna be practicing whatever state um, you're doing pharmacy school in. But if you go elsewhere, you're gonna have to relearn all of that on your own. And then the last class that most schools are gonna require is toxicology. So we talked about everything between, you know, medications and toxicities and overdoses with medications to 
metals like aluminum and magnesium in the environment to actual hazardous things such as what happens if somebody drinks floor cleaner. Um, kids eat and drink the darndest things. Um, I covered the ER in residency and I still see it now. Accidental ingestions happen. So what do you do and how do you find the information you need to take care of a patient who has ingested something um, that's potentially toxic or got it on their skin or whatever. And then of course there are elective opportunities. So classes that you can pick that kind of go towards a route that you wanted to go down yourself. So I did electives in zoology um, and like zoonotic infections because I knew I wanted to go into the hospital and kids are prone to a lot of infections. Um, I also did a nutrition class and I also took a pediatrics elective. So um, I did a couple others, but I don't remember them because they didn't end up applying as much, but those electives can kind of help gear you towards the clinical knowledge or area of practice you want to go in. Experiential learning is honestly the fun part of pharmacy school. It's where you're actually getting to see patients apply all of that learning that you did in the classroom. So you have IPPEs, which are introductory pharmacy practice experiences. So this is in community and hospital practices typically. So in your retail pharmacies, and then also in a hospital. This is just to be a broad overview of these settings, but you'll work on patient counseling skills. You'll start to get an introduction into reviewing patient medical information, but your AP. PPEs or the advanced pharmacy practice experiences are the ones that get really exciting because you can pick any practice area. There are certain stipulations like a certain number you have to have in each area, but you can pick between different hospital specialties. I did everything from neonatal ICU to cardiology to psych. Um, so just tons of different opportunities there. Community pharmacy where you're, you know, choosing a practice site in the retail space. Um, you can do academia, where you are learning how to be a professor, what would be required for that. Um, management, ambulatory care, which is more of a clinic setting. Managed care, which is more from like an insurance or payer side. You can do industry, working with a pharma company. Um, you can work with pharmacy organizations. So there's just tons and tons of options. I feel like there's like endless opportunities when it comes to those areas. You can go across the country, you could stay local, whatever works for you and your goals long term. There's some with the CDC, the FDA, I mean, just like I said, tons of opportunities out there. But really the goal is to learn how to practice as a pharmacist in whatever areas you go to. Um, the duration of these will vary between like four to eight weeks, just depending on the school and how they're set up. That'll also vary between how many of them you have. But the ultimate goal is to be able to cover that area as a practicing pharmacist by the end of it to the best of your ability. Obviously, you can't actually do that because you're not licensed yet. But can you show the confidence that you would be able to um, by the end of that rotation is really the goal. So pharmacy school extracurricular activities are also important. And I feel like this um, is so key to really how I got to be where I am as a pharmacist. So number one, I held a job in pharmacy school. I actually worked as an intern where I am currently practicing as a pharmacist. Um, that was always the hope and goal. I didn't know if it would actually work out that way, but it did. So I worked as a intern at the Women's and Children's Hospital I'm currently at. I did a lot of technician activities at the beginning. So really staffing as a technician where I was filling medications, doing sterile compounding, that kind of became my thing. And the IV room was um, the area I spent a lot of time. The longer I was there, the more project I took on. I did some research um, within my institution at my job site um, and really developed a lot of mentors that way. So the pharmacist that I'm currently work with, they're still my mentors, even though we're now colleagues. Um, and developing those really important relationships, um, I feel like was very key for me. There are also pharmacy organizations that you can be involved in. Um, I did a lot of leadership opportunities. I started local. 
um, and was a policy vice president for the American Pharmacist Association and did a few other leadership um, opportunities like being class secretary. Um, but those actually developed into larger opportunities. So I was able to be a regional officer for the American Pharmacist Association, as well as a student representative on one of the national committees. Um, so that leadership was also an opportunity for a lot of networking and getting to meet people um, just from across the country that are practicing pharmacists, as well as students. Um, some of my best friends have come from these pharmacy organizations and they weren't even in my school. The people that I talked to most were actually from other schools that we just had similar interests. So it was a really fun opportunity as well. You know, we did a lot of traveling pre COVID and were able to go like this is in um, Washington DC at the United States Capitol building where we were meeting with representatives to talk about important pharmacy topics. Um, with our legislators. So those opportunities were really, really cool. And there's also opportunities to volunteer and really build your clinical skills. So being able to do things like blood pressure screenings, I did a lot of those immunization clinics through volunteering um, with pharmacy organizations. So there's a lot of great opportunities like that, but a lot of fun as well. Um, of course, when you travel, you're going to do some fun things like eat at different restaurants or um, go do different activities. We did a trip where we were in San Francisco and we left a day early. So we were able to um, do some exploring and touristy things. And then lastly is research, which if you decide to go into a clinical setting, some research will usually be recommended or required. Um, and I did that through my job, but those are also opportunities that you can get through the school as well. Just reaching out to mentors through the school to find opportunities that fit what you wanna do in the future. So after pharmacy school, you have the opportunity to go directly into practice. It's totally acceptable to do so. Um, most students go that route, but there's also the opportunity to do postgraduate training. Um, so over on the side are pictures of me with my co-residents um, when I did residency. So I did a postgraduate year one residency at a children's hospital in Texas. Um, there is also the opportunity to postgraduate year two um, opportunities in a particular specialty. And this is mostly clinical training. So you're gonna be working with patients, you're going to be doing clinical rotations like you do as a student, but at a very higher level. Um, so you're kind of walking in day one as that pharmacist and building those skills and becoming a better pharmacist, doing a lot of learning about disease states. And honestly, it made me a better pharmacist. Um, there's a lot of other opportunities and things that you do. So you'll do some non-clinical rotations like with admin or medication safety. Um, you'll also do a research project is required for that as well. And there's just tons and tons of little things throughout like volunteering and um, mentoring a student and learning how to become a preceptor. I did a teaching certificate program through that. Um, residency is very vigorous. I did 60 to 80 hour weeks. Um, you work for about half, actually for my current salary would be probably about a third of my current salary. So you're definitely getting paid less, but you're getting a lot of clinical training that can help you in the future if you wanna go into a hospital setting or a specialty area. And then fellowships are also an opportunity that pharmacists can do. So if you wanna be a clinical pharmacist, um, residency is probably the most traditional route, but fellowships can be done with or without um, prior residency training. These are typically dedicated to a certain practice area, and they're a little bit more research focused than clinical focused, um, but most of them do have a clinical opportunity. Um, and fellowship is also the route for industry um, pharmacists, and most of the time they don't have residency training. The fellowship is done immediately after pharmacy school, but again, there are so many different routes and ways that people end up in industry positions or clinical pharmacist positions. There's no one right way to do it. And you don't necessarily have to get a residency. It is just becoming more prevalent. So if that's a route that you're wanting to go down, planning for a residency right on to pharmacy school is usually the recommendation. 
So with all of that, what do I actually do as a clinical pharmacist? We talked about all the massive amount of training that I had to do, but what does my job actually entail? So um, I am a pediatric and women's health clinical pharmacist. That kind of just comes with our patient population being a women's and children's hospital. I am currently the overnight pharmacist. So I work seven days on, seven days off, Monday through Sunday, 9 p.m. to 8 a.m., so 11-hour shifts, and I do seven 11-hour shifts in a row. I'm the only pharmacist in the hospital for the majority of that, so I lose my other pharmacist at 10 p.m., and then the next person comes in at 6 a.m. Weekends, we have even less coverage, so from 9 to 7.30, I am covering by myself with one technician. Um, I'm very blessed to have amazing technicians. They are the reason that everything runs so smoothly. But I'm covering the entire bed hospital and we have 24 seven clinical pharmacy services, which I'll talk about later what those entail. But I'm covering the emergency department, general pediatrics, maternal health, labor and delivery, the neonatal intensive care unit, as well as pediatric intensive care unit and our operating room, which doesn't have patients scheduled usually until like six or seven, but I'm covering and prepping meds for the morning surgeries, as well as any emergency surgeries, such as appendectomies that may pop up in the middle of the night. So since I do nights, it's more of a night in the life of a pharmacist, but what does that look like? So my primary job is to verify medication orders. What this really entails is me getting anything that the physician would like to order or practitioner would like to order. It comes to me through a verification queue. I can see all of those orders and I look at every detail of that from what the medication is, is the product correct, um, routing it to the right place. So if it's something that's up where the nurse can get it in an automated dispensing cabinet, we're making sure it routes there. Is it something that we have to make and I need to communicate with the technician that it needs to be made? Making sure that the dosing interval is appropriate, making sure the drug and dose is appropriate for the patient, especially with pediatric and pregnant women, those can vary. Is it safe and effective? And just looking at all those details to make sure whatever we're sending out is the best for the patient. Um, sometimes that includes saying, we don't have this medication available. What are we gonna do about it? Does the patient have their own? Can I get it from another hospital? Is it necessary for while they're here? Like things like birth control frequently aren't necessary just depending on their indication. So can we just not give that while they're in the hospital for a few days or is that something we need to find a way to get? Um, I also do a lot of answering drug information questions. So this can be from a nurse or a physician, but I answer everything from, can we run this IV and this IV at the same time because not all drugs are compatible? Um, so is it safe to give both of those at the same time? Sometimes I'm answering questions um, about dosing recommendations or product recommendations, or you know, just what do we have available? What do you recommend? Um, I also just am there to answer any medication questions that they have um, for patients. I also monitor therapeutic drug levels. We have, again, 24-7 clinical um, pharmacy coverage, which includes our dosing service. So this can vary between hospitals, but where I am at, pharmacy doses all of the vancomycin, or aminoglycosides, which includes like gentamicin and tobramycin that come through. So we'll get a order that says pharmacy to dose, whatever drug that they would like. Um, I look at the patient's renal, liver function, um, their weight, if they've had previous um, doses of this and dose the medication. And then we'll continue to follow up with their drug levels and make adjustments as appropriate as we get levels. So I can um, order levels for the patient. Um, I communicate with nursing teams if we're going to get levels, all of those things. Um, I will check sterile and non-sterile compounds that our technician make throughout the night um, and monitor any of the technician activities like filling automated dispensing cabinets or taking medications that were missing up to a patient. I don't typically make um, medications, but I do on occasion, particularly chemotherapy is something that I will sometimes make in the morning 
usually have another pharmacist to do that, but it doesn't always work out just depending on patient need or if there's any emergent needs. Um, like an ectopic pregnancy may need methotrexate in the middle of the night, so I may need to make that. And then we also, um, I have taken kind of upon myself, we weren't having any of our women's health services um, covered clinically by a pharmacist and doing chart reviews. So that is something that I do in the middle of the night when I have time, it doesn't always happen. Um, but when I can, I will complete chart reviews by looking at their medication list and make sure everything is appropriate. I look at their home medications, make sure anything that needs to be restarted, it has been restarted, um, check the doses of what's on board, make sure it's right for the indication and look for any drug interactions, that sort of thing. And then I also serve as a member of the rapid response team. So anytime a patient um, is coding, we call it the code blue, where the patient has stopped breathing and we're having to resuscitate them. I will respond as the pharmacist. Um, we had one of these the other night that lasted several hours and it can definitely be exhausting being the only pharmacist in that. But I do believe that being there and being a part of that is critical for the patient's um, overall success um, and resuscitation response. So we make everything from drug recommendations. We are drawing up medications at the bedside, giving it to the nursing team and just a plethora of other things. It's a very chaotic time. So we do anything and everything we can for medications. So it's not always an easy gig. Um, I've had several nights where it's just exhausting because I am the only pharmacist. And so that night where we had a code that's lasting several hours and we have a very critical patient, but I'm also having to take care of all the other patients in the hospital can be difficult. Um, we also have a lot of training and continuing education we have to do. And a lot of that occurs outside of my week. So yes, I have seven days on and seven days off, but I do frequently spend some time on my seven days off doing extra things like getting CPR certified for um, advanced CPR, which includes the medications and advanced resuscitations for pediatric patients, or doing continuing education to keep up to date with things or reading articles. Um, so it's not necessarily an easy lifestyle to be a pharmacist, but I will tell you, it is always, always worth it. Um, even on those difficult days, I know that what I'm doing as a pharmacist makes an impact, that I am an important part of the healthcare team. And what pharmacy brings to the table is really allowing patients to have the safest and most effective medications for whatever their disease state is. And so being a part of that is really, really awesome, especially getting to work with those vulnerable, vulnerable populations such as pediatrics and women's health, where there's a lot more of a gray area that you work in versus adults. Um, adult medicine, there's a lot of guidelines. There's a lot of, you do this, 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 and this in this exact order. That's the steps you go through. Well, pediatrics and uh, women's health have some of that. There's a lot of areas where it's like, okay, well, we know that this works for sure. If that's not working, well, there's a lot of gray and this may work and this might work and this might work. And so you're doing a lot more interpreting literature and choosing patient specific therapies than you're doing with adults. So it's a really awesome opportunity for pharmacists to be a part of it. I talk to our physician teams continuously throughout the night, especially when we have critical or difficult patients um, who maybe are on second, third, fourth line therapies and getting recommendations and giving dosing recommendations and those sorts of things. So pharmacy can be difficult, but it's definitely something that I have found worth it for me. So aside from what I'm doing, taking care of patients, what else do we do to provide better care for patients in the future? And that is research. So research as a clinical pharmacist can really vary depending on your practice site and what your interests are. There are definitely pharmacists who don't really get involved in research. That's not their forte. Um, and they may do projects or other things within the department that are still extremely beneficial to patients, but might not be something that they're presenting um, a poster for at a clinical meeting or getting published. Um, but there's also a lot of different roles that you can play. So as I said, residents all have to do a project, a research project. So 
being a project mentor where you have a resident that you are teaching how the, teaching them how to do research effectively and kind of guiding their project. Some of them do choose to be a primary investigator for clinical research in some shape or form. Um, there are also investigative investigational drug services pharmacists. I actually got to do a rotation in, in this in residency and it's a really cool opportunity where these pharmacists are helping dispense the medications for clinical trials and those patients who are on clinical trials. And so they're the ones who are prepping those medications, making sure we're following protocol for medications, making sure that every visit the patient actually qualifies to get medications. Um, and it's a really cool job. Through this, they are also usually the ones that are helping if you're going to do something um, that's a little bit more experimental. So for example, on my rotation was in March. And so we had a patient who would have qualified for remdesivir if they were an adult. So we petitioned the FDA to get the meds sent to us for our patient and they actually did. So we had to develop a protocol for the patient and go through multiple, multiple steps to get the drug for the patient. So those pharmacists um, play a key role in that. We actually did the treatment plan and we did all of the paperwork and kind of just had the physician review it and sign it um, because they're taking care of a lot of patients. So we kind of took that role for them. So they are really um, the ones assisting drug preparation for clinical trial patients, but other pharmacists um, may be involved in that as well. And then the focus is usually a little bit more on operational or clinic setting um, research versus lab-based research. Um, I don't know many clinical pharmacists who do lab-based research unless they are in academia as well and serve as a professor and are commissioned to do so through the university. And then they also may choose to publish or present their clinical um, research at a meeting. So it's just kind of variable between um, where you wanna go, but they definitely have a role. Um, I've presented a couple posters at um, national meetings and I'm currently, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, um, sending off a manuscript for publication. So those are definitely things that pharmacists do um, in a clinical role. And then some other specialty areas is the role of organ donation. So as a pharmacist, you're dealing with a lot of medications that are important for these patients and getting them right is extremely important to reduce the rate of the patient rejecting an organ. So things that a lot of people don't think about is prior to organ donation, usually um, patients require what's called a brain death exam to ensure that they are truly don't have any brain function left in order to be called um, deceased officially. So you can start prepping the body for organ donation. So one of the roles of a pharmacist, if we have a patient who the family is interested in organ donation, we make sure that all of the medications that they were on that could potentially affect their brain function have been stopped. So anything that could be sedating or um, altering mentally, we take those off and make sure they're off for a long enough period of time that they're completely out of the system and wouldn't affect that exam. Um, also, once the brain death exam is done, we still have to keep the body physically alive and sustained for organ donation. So you don't typically have a patient who dies in the ICU and then immediately gets swept away for surgery for organ donation. That's um, not how that process works at all. Typically the body has to be sustained for a few days for the proper testing to be done to make sure there's no um, issues where the organ may not be fully functional. So we have to make sure all the organs that are donated are fully functional and would be fully functional for the donor or for the patient who would receive that donation. We also have to make sure there's no infections um, that we hadn't caught yet. So all of these patients now are having to get tested for COVID if they hadn't already. So those are all like things that we have to think about. And so we help monitor the medications that are needed to sustain the body prior to organ donation. And also make sure that there's no medications that could lead to negative outcomes for an organ, organ donation later on. 
We also help on the other side when we have recipients of organ donations. So there are a lot of medications needed to reduce risk of um, rejection. We do a lot of immunosuppressants. We do medications um, to really make sure that the body is not gonna fight the organ. So we will deal with a lot of that prepping ahead of time. I've been involved in that overnight a couple of times where I had patients who were gonna come in for organ donation that was gonna happen in the morning. And so we're prepping them in the middle of the night. Um, I think one of the coolest um, recipient preparations that I got to do was for a set of siblings who both were getting a kidney from the same donor. And we had to do um, medications for both of those siblings, which was really cool. And then we also do follow-up um, care post-transplant. So you'll have pharmacists who actually will specialize in tra transplant. And then you'll have those like me who kind of just help whenever the patients come in. But if there is a transplant specific pharmacist, they're going to be heavily involved in medication levels and adjustments, patient counseling before that they leave. Um, and then if there's not somebody who's transplant specific, we'll do a lot of that on the clinical pharmacist end as well. And so we look at the medication levels to make sure um, that they're at the right amount for where they are in their stage um, post-transplant because it will vary where they need to be throughout. So we'll make sure that their drug levels are appropriate and the amount of drug that they're getting is appropriate. And then also talk to them about the importance of these medications, side effect profiles, those sorts of things. And then anytime those patients get admitted to the hospital, we'll once again review those medications. One of the critical things that we are involved in is making sure that those medications are number one, restarted, and number two, anything that we're needing to add on for maybe an acute infection or for a trauma or whatever may happen doesn't have any interactions with those medications, or if they do, we're getting the proper drug levels to make sure that those immunosuppressant drugs are kept at the right level. So those are kind of the big things that we do in organ donation. I can tell you is one of the most awesome experiences to be a part of that team as a pharmacist and being involved in such a really cool thing. Um, Organ donation can also be sad when you are doing the opposite end where you're taking care of the person who is donating. Um, but it's also can be really impactful and sometimes very beneficial for the families from a closure perspective if they're able to see, um, you know, something happy come out of such a bad situation. So as far as the role of the healthcare team, I've talked a lot about working with the team, but really our ultimate goal is we are the medication experts. We have so many awesome um, resources in the hospital. We have physicians that, yes, they do know medications, um, but they frequently don't go into the depth of detail that we do as pharmacists. So we are really there to serve as a resource for information for them. Um, we don't know everything off the top of our heads, but we probably can get to it a lot faster than many physicians because that is what we're trained to do. We're trained to look for those drug resources and drug information if we don't have it available. Um, and you know, we can free up the physician to do other things while we look for those. Um, we also will teach residents and students in not only our profession, but different professions as well. So frequently pharmacists will do lectures for um, students in med schools or PA schools or nursing schools, you frequently have a pharmacist that will teach those pharmacology classes. Um, I also do a lot of on-site training. So if I see a medication error um, that's prescribed by a resident, I will give them a call and I won't just tell them, you know, this is wrong, you need to fix it. No, no, no. Um, I work at a teaching hospital, so I take it an opportunity to have a discussion with the resident about, you know, why I'm making a recommendation that's different than theirs and really have the opportunity to teach them about the medications um, so they can do better in the future. And frequently we're working together to come up with a plan for patients. So it's a really awesome opportunity there as well. We also serve kind of as a safety net for medication orders. Everybody is human. I work with such awesome physicians and some of the best physicians I know still make errors because they're humans. So we'll look at that order and sometimes we're like, okay, 
that's not what they meant at all, especially when you have something that's like ridiculously high or ridiculously off. Um, you know that that was probably a typo. Um, but then sometimes it's just there's variations between indications and with um, patients that are pediatrics, we are doing weight based dosing. Um, sometimes we do that for pregnant women as well. So maybe the weight based dosing calculation is a little bit off. So we're going to check that. And we just make sure that every order that's going through is safe and effective. We also counsel um, patients on safe and effective medication use. So if they're starting something new, particularly things like blood thinners, we're giving them the information they need to do that um, safely. And then we um, can also serve as a part of an interdisciplinary rounding team. Since I work on nights, I don't currently do this, but we do have pharmacists who will round in our ICUs with the team and just kind of serve as that drug resource and look at the medications for those patients every single day to make sure everything that they're on is safe and effective and necessary. Um, we're also frequently a medication safety advocate. So if we feel like we see something going on that is unsafe, whether it's through the system where the system is broken um, and we need to fix something because there's not safety nets in place to prevent incorrect ordering from happening, or if we just see something not going correctly or being ordered incorrectly, we can step up and say, hey, I don't think this is safe. And we kind of serve as an advocate for the patient for their safety. And then something that nobody really told me when I went to pharmacy school was how much I would assist with IT issues, but we frequently are working um, to fix the technology that we have to make um, medication ordering and dispensing safer. And so the last thing I wanted to talk about is the other thing that I do, which is not during my 77 hour work week, it is my week off, which is my social media happy farm life. So my goal is really to educate women on how to live happier, healthier lives while taking medication. Um, I go over everything from medication adherence, birth control, medication use during pregnancy and lactation, labor delivery, vaccinations. Um, it's also been an opportunity for me to mentor students and advocate for the profession of pharmacy and women in healthcare. So if you guys enjoy this presentation and you would like to follow along, I would be more than happy to have you and connect with you. I am on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter under Happy Farm Life. And I have a website, happyfarmlife.com that has several blog posts and other links to things that I've done like this, other talks and podcast epi episodes on various topics. Um, so with that, what questions do you guys have for me? I know that there was a lot popping up, so I'm ready. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, we learned so much from you. We're just going to go through all the questions in the chat, as well as um, the ones that we got from the Google form. So <laughs> the first question we have here, it is that what clubs were you part of in high school? Um, from high school, so I was in part of what was called Beta Club, which was kind of an mm -hmm. honor society. Um, I know not every place has that, so um, I was also a part of the science club, um, mm -hmm. the Spanish club, which I have learned all, lost all of my Spanish skills, <laughs> um, which is very unfortunate because I did learn new words whenever I was in Texas briefly, but um, I, I've lost a lot of that because I haven't used it as much. And let me think, those were probably the two that I was, or like the three that I was most active in. Um, but I think I was involved in like other things just like throughout depending on um, where I was. So I was involved in student council and was like the student council secretary um, at one point in time. Um, so yeah, high school has been a long time ago, but I remember those. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so another question, did you take IB or AP or any such program in high school? So my school did not have that available, but I highly recommend it for anybody who does have that available. Um, I don't know if I would do it for every class, but things like your English composition or um, even calculus, I think that it would be good um, depending on how comfortable you are and how good of a chemistry and biology classes you are. I would just be very cautious with that. It's very tempting to do 
but I would just make sure wherever you're getting that from is a very good and rigorous course because that's going to be your foundation for whatever else you're doing. And if that foundation is not strong, it could definitely hurt you in the long run. But from a cost perspective, as well as a time perspective, anything that you could either clip out of or you could take an AP class in, I highly recommend doing that. I wish I would have had that opportunity. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, this is the next question we have is, is it possible to maintain a proper work life balance as a pharmacist and how difficult is it to achieve this? So it's something I'm still struggling with. Um, as a resident, there is no balance. You are, it's like residency, life maybe gets to happen sometimes. I worked um, 14 days in a row, we get two days off and I just did that continuously. And so that was absolutely draining. Um, no, it was 12 days on that 14 days, 12 days on two days off and a 14 day stretch. So as a resident, I didn't have much balance at all. Um, I tried to take some time off. My husband actually was still living in Missouri when I was in Texas. It just worked out for both of us um, to progress in our professions. Um, we had to do that and I'm glad that we did that. It was a hard year, but I would try to take time off each month to see him pre-pandemic. <laughs> Didn't have much opportunities once the pandemic hit, but I did my best to do that. Now, um, it is very hard to get out of that student resident mode, um, but I feel like I've done a lot better and continue to do a lot better. I have made sure that I incorporate days where I take time off and I try to do all of the stuff that I need to do um, during my week off. So my week on, I can take that time to relax in between shifts um, to really have balance. Um, I spend a lot of time with my husband now and I prioritize that. And I think you have to actively prioritize that in order to be successful with the work-life balance situation. Am I perfect at it? No. Um, do I feel like I get enough time away from work? Yes. Um, it also just depends on your role. For me, um, I do not work at my work email on my week off. I've made that a priority. I said, if there's anything urgent that you need or you need me to cover an extra shift or something because you know somebody's sick, you have my phone number, you can call, you can text me. I'm not gonna look at my email. So my boss also knows that and is comfortable with that. And so I think that's just having that open communication that for me, my priority is being at home and taking that time off. Um, I do a lot of things like this though in my time off, but it's because I enjoy it. So I consider that a balance for me because I do really like doing these talks and I do really like doing the social media pieces. Um, and I try to do that on my week off um, when my husband's not home, but the days that my husband's off, I prioritize spending time with him and doing things with him and my family. So it's definitely possible, but you have to work at it. <laughs> mm -hmm. We definitely think that balance is super important. And yes, it's definitely a work in progress all the time. Uh, so we just wanted to know, like, how do you think your overall journey has been? And have you ever had like regrets about going on like this difficult journey? Um, whew. My journey has been, it's, it's like even hard to think about the beginning of this journey because it feels like it was such a whirlwind, like in the middle of it, I thought it was taking forever. And I'm like, oh, I just want to get through pharmacy school. Or, oh, I just want to get through residency. But looking back, I was like, oh my gosh, that just went by so fast. Um, I don't have any regrets going down the path that I did. Um, I think I probably would have taken more time away from school. I was definitely a workaholic and kind of overworked myself sometimes doing too much leadership stuff or too much stuff for organizations and realized um, later on that, you know, I need to prioritize myself more and I'm doing that more. Um, but I'm glad I decided to go to school to be a pharmacist. Um, I do not regret doing a residency. Were there times that I was like, why the heck did I do this to myself when I was a resident? Absolutely. There was those same times in pharmacy school. Um, but looking back on it, it, it's all been worth it. And everything I've done not only makes me a better pharmacist for my career, but also makes me a better patient advocate for my patients and better pharmacists for my patients. So I think all of that is worth it. It's definitely a roller coaster. You're going to have semesters or even weeks that are just hard. I had a week in residency where 
I was working 10 hours a week because we had babies. I had, we had like 90 babies in the NICU and that was the rotation I was in. So I was having to help take care of all of these babies. Our normal is 60 and we had 90. So it was all hands on deck, taking care of all the babies that we had everywhere. Um, so, you know, we were working extra long days. I had two presentations I had to do. I didn't hardly sleep. By the end of it, I was just exhausted. But then the next week it was fine because we discharged a bunch of them and then we had 60 babies and I didn't have any presentations and I could breathe. Like, so you're gonna have weeks and days that are gonna vary. That's even with your job. My last week at work was the hardest week I have had since I started. But then, you know, my next week could be fine. I don't know. It's just, you know, it just kind of varies. So I think residency prepared me for that. Um, but it's definitely hard. And if your heart is not in that, it's not going to work out. But if you really have a passion for what you're doing, I think it's totally worth it. Definitely. I think we all agree with that. Uh, so the next question we had is more about how you can become a pharmacist in uh, the United States of America if you're from another country such as Canada or overseas. So I get this question a lot and I wish I knew more about it, um, but that was not my journey. So what I have found from doing some research is it's really going to vary between where you went to school, what country you're coming from, what your training looks like wherever you're at, um, because sometimes that degree does not meet the qualifications to be a licensed practitioner in the United States. So you may have to take more courses. You may have to retake courses um, that you took already because they don't have everything that is needed in order to qualify for the United States. So it's really going to vary a lot between countries and what training you got. The other things to note is if you're looking at doing a residency, um, every hospital will have different rules. Some hospitals will not take people on visas for residency. They may take them for jobs, but not residency. It depends on like the legal liability for that hospital and what they're willing to do and take. Um, so that's another consideration. And that will be something that if you're interested in applying to that hospital, being open and honest with that um, program before you apply. So you don't waste your money and don't waste their time and they don't waste your time either. Other things to consider is also um, each state has different licensing requirements and those requirements can vary as far as if you're from another country, what they require you to do. Um, so there may be additional tests that you have to take. Um, there may be, again, certain classes and degrees that they you know accept in different forms so really the best place to go is the nabp website so nabp.com it's the national associations of boards of pharmacy um, that is really the best place to go to start your search in that area and then looking at specific states that you might be interested in living in and seeing what their requirements are and if you meet those regardless pretty much everybody will have to take the NAPLEX, which is our board exam, our clinical board exam, and then whatever state that they want to be licensed in, you'll still have to take that law exam, just like every licensed pharmacist in the United States would have to do if we got a degree in the United States, um, as well as knowing what your requirements are going to be for wherever you want to work. So a lot of retail pharmacies require an immunization certification, so you may have to get that in order to work there. So those are all things to consider, but like I said, it's going to vary between institution, um, if you want to be in a hospital or whatever pharmacy you're wanting to work at, what their requirements are, the state requirements, and then um, just where you're from, what that falls into is equivalently wise from the national level. It's kind of a complex answer. <laughs> no, but we're, we're really thankful that you could share the information that you have. And I'm sure people that are interested in this would definitely do more research. Uh, past this. So the next question is kind of related to that work-life balance. Somebody in the chat asked, what does your sleep schedule look like when you work 11-hour night shifts and then you have a week off? Um, I wish I could say it's the same every week, but it's not. I'm still like testing what I want to do. I think that I've started to find the best balance for me. So um, for example, tomorrow is the night that I will, Sunday night, I will stay up as long as I possibly can. Usually I'll take like a one or two hour nap at like 11 or midnight and then stay up until the morning and then fall asleep 
at like eight or 9 a.m. and then sleep until the afternoon, wake up at 4.30 or five o'clock. Um, that gives me time to, I usually do a workout, um, do any like housekeeping things. Like if I need to do laundry or dishes, do all of that stuff and then um, make dinner and eat dinner, spend some time with my husband and go to work. Um, I get off at that 8 a.m. So then I usually come home and I do that nine o'clock to like 4.35 sleep schedule throughout my on week. And so when I get off on Monday morning, I usually try to stay up until like 11 or noon. And then it just depends. I sleep anywhere between three to six hours, kind of just judging by how tired I am and take like a nap in the middle of the day. So like this week I was exhausted. So I just went ahead and slept like five hours. Normally I try to do like three nap on Monday and then I'm up in the evening, can eat dinner with my husband um, and then go to bed at a normal time to kind of like flip back. Um, usually those first couple days I flip back, I'm like extremely tired. And then I just wake up whenever my body tells me to, um, which varies. This week it's decided that we're gonna wake up at 6 a.m. Last week I woke up at 11 every day. So it just really depends. I kind of just try to listen to my body. I do take melatonin during my week on. Um, so I can actually try to get myself to fall asleep because I really struggle if I don't take something. Um, so I take a low dose of melatonin to try to sleep during the day. Um, and I have a face mask to try to like block out the light. And I wear like sunglasses when I leave the hospital. So even if it's like dim outside, I just try to like block as much light as possible. So my body doesn't realize that it's daytime <laughs> and I can get some sleep. So yeah, it's, it's definitely difficult. It's pretty hard on your body, but uh, I still like my seven days off. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think everyone has like some struggles with their sleep schedule. Uh, well, our next question is, do you ever suffer through burnout? And if you do, what do you do to help yourself get better? Um, so I definitely had burnout in residency and sometimes I realized I just needed to advocate for myself and say, I'm reaching the point of no return. I need a break. I need some days off and taking my time off. Um, I'm not had as much problems in this position as a pharmacist because I do have seven days off every seven days, you know, my 14 day stretch. So that has been definitely helpful for burnout because for example, last week, like I said, was very difficult. Um, we had a patient that was just very critical all week long, particularly one night at the beginning of my week. And I had trouble sleeping after that. Um, just all the adrenaline going from being a part of that situation. So I took extra days off this week. And so normally I post a lot on social media. Like I do one long video a week on YouTube, short videos every day two TikToks a day and a post on Instagram. Like I do a ton of stuff cause I like usually batch it ahead of time but I just took this week off except for Instagram cause I had all of the Instagram stuff done already. So I'm having to do a set post for that. But um, all of the other stuff that was gonna require my extra time and attention I just said, you know what I'm not gonna do it this week because I need the break. And so I took several days like three solid days off at the beginning of this week to just relax, do nothing, read books. Monday, I just laid in bed and read all day. <laughs> and so sometimes you just have to tell yourself it's okay to take time off. You don't have to do everything for everyone else. You can take time for you. Um, and burnout is a major problem in pharmacy. I've had several friends who've dealt with it, especially in management roles and the retail space. It gets very difficult. We're in the middle of a pandemic. People aren't getting the time off that they need. They're understaffed. Um, and sometimes you just have to say, you know, I need my time off and you take that PTO that is available to you and you just have to advocate for yourself. I think that's the biggest thing that I've learned is nobody's gonna advocate for yourself to not be burned out, you're gonna have to advocate for you. And just learning when you are getting close to that point of burnout and you need that time off. Um, I've started to recognize the signs inside myself. I get very like short fused and I don't want to be that way towards other people, particularly my husband is the one who gets that ramification. And he also will tell me when I'm getting to that point, he's like, I think you need to take a break. <laughs> just slow down a little bit. 
Um, but not just listening to yourself, but other people around you when you recognize those sides of burnout and knowing when to say no to things as well. Mm -hmm, definitely. And uh, it's really, it's like amazing how you kind of go through those difficulties and the way that you kind of bring yourself up uh, back again. And uh, it's a really difficult route. And so somebody was wondering, what's the best part of your job? Like, what makes you think that I'm so happy or glad that you kind of took this path? Well, my patients are awesome. I mean, my patients are the cutest. I'm, I'm just very lucky. They're adorable. They're kids, you know. Um, I think the best part of my job, I just automatically think of particularly in the neonatal intensive care unit, um, we have patients that will spend months with us because they're bored preterm. And so getting to be a part of their mother's care before they give birth or during the birth and then taking care of them when they are born and then getting to see them walk out of the NICU with their families, like that brings me so much joy knowing that we were a part of that and being able to have that mom take their baby home at the end of that when their baby would have died otherwise, if we hadn't done the interventions that we did, like that is just so freaking rewarding. And those days where I'm like, oh my gosh, so-and-so gets to go home and they've been here for two months. Like this is the most exciting thing ever. And they're not on oxygen and we're off of all of our meds and they're going home and just going to be a baby. Like, this is great. Um, those moments are so awesome. The organ donation moments are so awesome when we have kids that have successful organ donations. Um, I also just love those moments when we've had moms that are really critical and have really severe preeclampsia and we can safely deliver a baby as well as keep mom safe and go home at a reasonable time. Like all of those things where we are really providing those life-saving interventions and then I get to see the patients go home at the end of that, like that is just so awesome. Like the impact that we can have on patients is awesome. And that's what I love. Awesome. That sounds great. Uh, so one of the students were asking, sorry about that. <laughs> Do you have any advice for the students looking to go into pharmacy? So if you have not heard this already and you're interested in pharmacy, I will be the first to tell you, and you will hear this many more times, but pharmacy is a very small world. Um, Pharmacists are very tight knit communities. And so networking is a key. So not just networking at like local events or even at conferences, because now that's, you know, becoming less and less with the virtual situation and probably will be for a while, but also making connections with people online through, you know, a personal brand where you're, you know, posting what you're interested about and your journey or whatever and connecting with people on there. Some people that I talk to all the time and are like most supportive of me are people that I have never met in person. <laughs> they're these, they're not strangers anymore, but they're pharmacists that are also um, actively involved in like Instagram or TikTok that I've been able to connect with. So those are awesome opportunities and finding people um, on those platforms that are pharmacists that are doing what you want to do and reaching out to them and making connections with them. That would be something that I would do if I were going into this now, um, because there are more and more pharmacists who are on those platforms that are providing awesome information about their jobs. And so you can really learn from them. Um, the other thing is like getting pharmacy experience, whether it's like doing things like this, where you're doing kind of like a virtual shadowing or if you can actually get in there in a pharmacy, whether you're like working as a technician or not, you don't necessarily have to do that. I think it's very beneficial if you do, but if you don't have that opportunity wherever you're at, um, shadowing in a pharmacy, asking a local pharmacist if they would be willing to shadow with you. Cause not only is that awesome networking and getting to know somebody who's in that space and could potentially be a letter writer for your pharmacy school application, but also just learning about the job to see if it's right for you because you know I could tell you this is all the stuff that I'm doing um, but maybe you'll look at a different area and you'll love that more maybe you are more somebody who's like geared towards community pharmacy or maybe you're somebody who's geared towards the ER I don't want to be in the ER at all but you know there's different people who are more adapt for different things and so finding where you like is really key um, and the earlier you do that, I think the better, because yes, you may change your mind, but having some kind of path or direction to go down is definitely beneficial as far as picking electives if you get accepted to pharmacy school or 
choosing your volunteer opportunities um, that kind of are fitting more towards what you want to do in the long run. Um, so I think that would be my biggest recommendations as well as getting involved in organizations with pharmacy. Um, those are huge. And that's a huge networking opportunity. It also was a really good opportunity for me to figure out where I wanted to end up and connect with pharmacists who are in those areas that I wanted to end up in. So um, all of those things I think together are really what's gonna benefit you the most. Thank you for all that advice. Um, so now we're gonna move on to a chat question and someone asked, is all of your work based around just giving medications or the things that you've listed or can you branch out and like participate in giving diagnosis and things like that? So diagnosing patients is completely out of the scope of my practice. I do not diagnose patients whatsoever. Um, we are focused more on, okay, we have a diagnosis. How are we going to treat that? Um, there are certain parts um, of the country where pharmacists can prescribe medications. Again, they're usually not giving a diagnosis for whatever this is. So Actually, in my state, we can, if you have the proper training, I don't do this because I work with peds and women's health. So when you hear this, you're gonna be like, of course she doesn't do this, but smoking cessation um, is something that some pharmacists are able to prescribe now without a prescription from a physician. So if a patient comes in and they wanna stop smoking and they want something that is stronger than what's over the counter, if they've tried that before, maybe it didn't work, there are pharmacists who are able to prescribe that. Birth control is another thing that several states pharmacists are allowed to prescribe those medications. So pharmacists can prescribe medications, but usually it's not because we're diagnosing them with anything. There are certain states that do allow some diagnostic tests to be done in pharmacies um, that are pretty definitive things like strep. They can do a strep test and give them antibiotics for that and prescribe antibiotics. Those would probably be the exceptions, but I'm not going to have somebody come in with like a skin rash and diagnose that and you know all of those things. It's really good. There's very minimal diagnosing. It might be just those areas where the tests will be definitive, like it is positive or negative for something. Um, and then doing antibiotics there, but that's gonna vary between each state. But for the most part, diagnostics is out of the scope of practice for a pharmacist. All right, thank you. And another question we had in the chat was, do pharmacists who work with organ donors have have to work with the person who has passed away to apply medications for organ donation? Yes. So we, so for example, when I was a resident, we had a patient who was a gunshot wound victim to the head. This patient um, had a positive brain death exam, meaning the patient did, um, was declared brain dead from his injury, unfortunately. And so part of my job for the next two to three days was to work with the organ donation company that comes in. So there was a organization, it's not a company, it's an organization that comes in that kind of helps coordinate that donation process with the donor as well as the recipient. And so we would review the medications um, if the patient started becoming unstable, we would help with dose adjustments of those medications. Um, we had some guidelines that we follow to make sure that everything stays within the appropriate range. And like I said previously, if the patient has not had a brain death exam yet and that is necessary, um, then we also look at the medications. For example, phenobarbital is a long acting sedative that some patients get. And so if that medication has been given within a certain time frame, um, depending on the dose, we'll also say, you know, we can't do this exam until, you know, 12 more hours or, you know, 48 more hours, just depending on the situation, whatever drugs they got. And so we're a part of that as well. Um, we don't do any of like what's happening in the OR or anything that happens to see organs after they're harvested. It's more so making sure everything stays kosher prior to donation. Mm -hmm. So on to our next question. Um, some uh, a student was wondering, did you ever plan on becoming a different medical profession? Uh, if so, were you interested in like a doctor or a nurse? And why did you choose pharmacy in the end? 
Okay, well, this is a fun question because um, so I did not know what I wanted to do other than I knew I liked to teach and I knew I liked science. So when I was 16, I had to take a quiz for school that determined it was like what you should be when you grow up. It's like one of those, you know, placement things that they do in high school. So I did this test and my number one choice was pharmacist. So I told my mom that I was, you know, like a sophomore in high school. I was like, mom, I got pharmacist. And I didn't, you know, really think a whole lot of it. I was like, oh, it's just another one of those quizzes. They've made us do these 12 times. But my mom knew I needed a summer job. So she thought that she should talk to the local pharmacy. <laughs> and so next thing I knew, I had an interview with the local pharmacy for a summer job. And then I worked in the pharmacy. I just fell in love with it. Um, I hadn't really like thought about doing nursing. I hate the sight of blood. I don't like blood. Mm -mm, not for me. So doctor was pretty much out of the question as well. Um, I never really had the desire to be a physician. Um, I have family members who are physicians. That just wasn't for me. But I knew I really liked the science part of it. And I liked chemistry. And so once I found pharmacy, I was like, okay, this has a lot of chemistry. I love learning how the drugs work and how they interact. And then it was also like, okay, I can teach. I can teach patients. I can teach students. I can teach, you know, other healthcare professionals. Like that kind of fit everything that I wanted. So for me, it was because of my experiences in the pharmacy that I decided I wanted to be a pharmacist. So from 16 on, I wanted to be a pharmacist. There were a few other times where I was like, oh, physical therapy might be cool or, oh, like there were moments where I thought about med school, but they didn't last very long because ultimately I really liked the pharmacy side of things and the chemistry piece. And that was very evident once I was in college and taking the courses because I was in courses with pre-med students. A lot of our stuff interacts, but or like intertwines the first couple of years of school, especially. We all have to take the microbiology and cell biology classes. We all have to take anatomy and physiology. And so they were really strong in the biology areas and more towards that. And I was like killing it in the chemistry classes, like organic chemistry was my jam. And they were all like, I hate this. So it was pretty evident to me that that was an area that I was stronger in. And so I went the pharmacy route and I'm glad I did. That sounds great. Uh, you mentioned how you were a pharmacist technician and we have a question um, asking, would becoming a pharmacist technician benefit someone who wants to become an anesthesiologist? Anesthesiologist, hmm. I think yes, but it would depend on where you were at. So I don't know that working in like a retail or community setting would be as beneficial as an anesthesiologist. I think it still could help because you're learning the process and being around patients and medications. But if you could work in a hospital, that would be huge. Anesthesiologists know probably more pharmacology than about any other specialty as like a whole and in general. I feel like I can have more in-depth pharmacology discussions with the anesthesiologists that I work with than a lot of the other professions and it's just based on their training and how in depth that they get with how those drugs work and they really know how the drugs that they're dealing with work um, which is awesome and so I think working in a like hospital pharmacy or an OR pharmacy which you can can do in a lot of places would be super beneficial. Um, I actually worked with an anesthesiologist who was a pharmacist prior she had gotten her bachelor's of pharmacy and then went back to become an anesthesiologist. And she told us frequently like how beneficial being a pharmacist prior to was. Um, obviously a pharmacy technician is not the same, but having an idea of where those medications come from, the process of acquiring them and the dispensing process, I think would make you a better anesthesiologist. I know several physicians who had been like a pharmacy tech or involved in pharmacy in some way before they became physicians and all of them have said that that was beneficial for them. So just seeing a different side of the process I think is helpful. Yep, yeah, so thank you so much for your answer and that's all for our questions. So thank you so much for your presentation. I'm sure we all really enjoyed it and I really enjoyed it. Um, so uh, any, if anybody has any extra questions you can just drop them in the chat and if not, thank you so much for the presentation.
Yep, uh, so let me just, uh, for our participants, let me just go over our, uh, how you get your volunteering uh, hours. So on our link tree, we will be posting a form tonight, uh, which you can fill out by Tuesday in order to receive your volunteer hours. And if you get over 50%, then we will be emailing the hours to your um, email. And just a quick thing, please, uh, if you can rename your um, name to the name you want on your volunteering form, then we would be able to send that to your email. So thank you all. We can uh, leave the meet right now and look out on our Instagram uh, for next seminars and also follow Happy Farm Life on TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram. Um, the volunteering uh, hours actually um, is a new thing, I think, because since we are all stuck at home, we don't really have much we can do outside. So it really depends on your school. Our school allowed us to, to um, attend these seminars and then get hours. But if your school doesn't, then um, we're sorry about that. But yes, other than that, unless you guys have any other questions, you guys are free to go. And we're so glad to have had this amazing seminar with you, Dr. Sierra. Thank you guys so much for having me. If you have any questions, just shoot me a message on Instagram. I'd be happy to answer.